Hey everybody, uh, I am not Stuart Lang, as is uh, quite obvious from the very beginning. Uh, for those of you who know me, my name is Julian Smith. I'm the president of the FIFA Master Alumni Association. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to, to put on this session for you uh, with someone who is famous within the, the FIFA Master Alumni community. Uh, I just wanted to come here and uh, yeah, mention that this is a, an initiative that was brought to us by Stuart, and we're really thankful for that. Our uh, interest as leaders of the Alumni Association is to make sure that we're continuing to foster connection and community by with all of our membership around the world and doing so in new, interesting, innovative ways, and especially ones that can keep us closer to the FIFA Master program itself. And I think this is a really good example of that. Uh, another way in which we're kind of changing the game from things that have been done in the past is with the recent announcement of our hybrid uh, multi-area model world gathering, where we'll, where we'll be organizing world gatherings during the FIFA Women's World Cup this summer in different locations around the world. So please check out our social channels and our internal communications for information about that. And as always, you can reach out to the FMA committee or Jean Frigedu as well, uh, our executive director. Uh, for all of you who are here, don't forget to please subscribe to the YouTube channel where we come out with some new interesting content every once in a while. Um, but now I, I really have the, the great pleasure of introducing uh, our guest speaker, our star of the show today, who is Stuart Lang. Uh, Stuart is someone, as I mentioned, who is known very much to the FIFA Master program and to the FIFA Master alumni, having participated in the program for several years now. Uh, Stuart, do you remember how many years you've been as part of the program? It, it must be about seven or eight, yeah. It must, okay. be, it must be. Yeah, so a, a legend uh, at this point within the, the alumni community, for sure, after all those years. But uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to mention a, a couple of things about this this, uh, this session today. First of all, so everyone is aware, Stuart approached us with this idea, this concept that we helped uh, put together. And I'm super grateful to you, Stuart, for, for doing so. I think it shows a lot of strength within our community. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's something that we very well received when you approached us because everyone who knows who's been lucky enough to have been in one of your sessions has gotten a lot out of it. And as you mentioned to us in preparation for this session, the content is always changing from year to year. And I think that makes it really interesting for those who have maybe done it during one of your first years, senior session to see what the updated uh, expertise on your end looks like. So thanks very much for for approaching us. And again, uh, we're, we're delighted to have you as a way of uh, introducing new programming and in innovative ways that can really expand our reach uh, to all our membership around the globe. So I just wanted to say a couple of words here. I see we've got uh, Bip, who's based out of California now, and Trini Boy, who is assuredly a deal uh, based in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but please, everyone else, let us know where, where you're calling in from around the world. We want to make this interactive. So Stuart is going to be talking for his presentation, but we'll leave time for questions at certain points. And if you have any comments or additional thoughts that you want to jump in, uh, please share them in the comment box. Uh, but with that, I'll leave it to Stuart with, again, my undying thanks for, for your time and your initiative here. And uh, really looking forward to the session, Stuart. Over to you. Thanks, Julian. Um, hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's um, great to sort of um, have the opportunity to talk um, about brands and relation to sport with with you. Um, it's something that as, as people have sort of been part of my guest lectures over the last few years have known that, that, that there is a real passion that I have for sport, and, but also linking sport with brand and understanding the power and the value that a brand can bring to sports and sports organizations across the world. Um, so what I thought it was always going to be good to do is to, is to, to share my latest sort of um, observations and, and, and talks and, and research with everyone as much as I can, because as you know, every year new stuff happens, um, good, bad, ugly, that we get to learn and we get to see from an agency perspective um, that you may not see. Um, and, it, and it does really impact on the bigger picture. So without further ado, it's just about talking through the, the actual presentation um, and really then sort of looking at how we can sort of ask those questions um, about the things that might come up. I've already received a few questions, um, but it'd be great then to really sort of uh, to learn about you guys 
and what you might be interested in sort of speaking about. Um, so I will, uh, not having worked on this one before, it's going to be quite a fun learning curve, um, but I will then just lessen my screen so I can uh, see everybody at the same time. Um, so really, what I really want to sort of understand, go through is really what is a brand? Um, and a brand is a set of responses um, and associations that people have about an individual, about an organization, about a product, about a service. And a brand is about a perception. And that really is influenced by many, many factors. Um, it can be influenced by the logos, by the colors, by the ambassadors, by the sounds, by the typefaces, messaging, shapes, symbols, imagery. And when you look at that and say, well, why is that all important? Because when it comes together, those very best brands exist across multiple channels. And that's where everybody, every fan, every participant, every athlete, every partner, sponsor, they engage with those brands in a number of different ways. Um, and so when I've you know, put the slides together around F1, they, they've been very much, you know, they've created and shaped their brand so that it works across every channel. So that when you look back at this and you look back at the typefaces, um, they've designed three or four different typefaces that work for perimeter advertising that can be seen at speed. They work on screen for gaming and for the, you know, looking at platforms and the dashboards when you're seeing things on television. And they are, they are one of those sports organizations that when a global pandemic came along, they absolutely had the brand assets and the brand strength of the brand in place to allow them to continually engage with their, with their fans, even through a, a global pandemic that stopped every other participation of other events. So that's where and why that is really important, because this day and age, um, we get to see how brands can talk to their audiences across so many different platforms and channels. Um, and when you see an organization do it well, then it's important to recognize and understand why they're doing things well. So that's why when we look at a brand like F1 and how they start to live and breathe across all of those channels, it really is a way to, 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 to recommend them and look at why they're doing things well. They even um, created bespoke software that helps their internal design process, which allows them to make their imagery look and feel more unique when they're posting it on social. Obviously, when you're, when you're using a lot of um, live footage and imagery from that's more editorial based, it, can, it could look like it comes from anywhere. But by them going to the lengths of creating their own software that allows them to create something that looks and feels more ownable and more consistent, then that becomes more, more protectable and more recognizable for them as an organization. So when, when you look at an organization like the URC, the, um, which doesn't necessarily have the budgets of the F1, they've still managed to create something really bold and distinctive and identifiable with beautiful design, really distinctive, that feels very relevant to their, to their fans and their organization. But each aspect is, they've done the same process and principles as F1, but they're doing things in a, in a slightly more simple way. The typefaces, the colors, everything comes together to make it feel distinctive, looking at different shapes and colors for the different teams. Um, when you then apply that to their brand imagery, their, 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 you know, their athlete imagery, they use those shapes to make it feel more ownable and relevant in the same way that F1 do, but in a slightly less um, massive budget kind of perspective. Um, but when you see how that system works, it's been designed for every single multiple channel, social, website, digital marketing, event collateral, but also they understand the importance of localization so that they've created a flexible identity system that allows some of those localized um, flags and elements to really come to part, to come to play within their individual identities. But then you look at <coughs> how a sport like cricket can be reborn and reinvented 
to expand its reach and appeal to a much larger audience. And so what they've done is create a, a brand with the 100 that feels absolutely relevant and modern and, and of the moment. But when you go to a, 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 a 100 game or when you watch it on TV, it absolutely jumps out of the screen and jumps out of the actual, you know, it elevates that experience because they've thought about all aspects of how the graphics, the colors, the typefaces, the messaging, the imagery, all really does play a huge part. And I'm a bit of a type geek, you know, as you can see with, with the, the rugby championships and with F1 and with this, all of these brands have created a bespoke typeface. Now, it doesn't have to be a hugely um, expensive or time consuming process. But what it does is it allows an organization to create something a lot more ownable and a lot more distinctive and memorable that can protect a brand and add value to it because it's a typeface and a, and a piece of and an asset that no one else has. So it's like making modifications to a house. If you do that, it's going to add value to it. But with, the, with a typeface, it allows you to resonate with the right audiences in the right ways. And as you saw with F1, using different typefaces to talk to the people on different channels, whilst also still feeling absolutely consistent um, in a very subtle way. So the way that the 100 have created their, their brand and those assets allow them to, to almost create digital stickers that people can then use and see across social that can animate brilliantly and create that sort of fun level of engagement. And all of these are really strong elements to a brand. Um, and for me, it's a really interesting um, addition to what's been happening with brands in the last few years is understanding the importance of ownable typefaces and colors and shapes and assets because a brand doesn't just exist as a logo or a poster it also really does jump out from every channel. Um, and that's where when I look, when you see a, a, a sport like the, the, the 100 with the cricket, they've really thought about how that, that level of, of interaction needs to work. And you're seeing across every sport now how technology from tennis to NFL to hockey is really embracing um, the technology behind you know, within sport to elevate the, 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 the engagement levels. But when you think about how a brand comes together, these are all massive factors of making it feel ownable. A brand is also about reputation. Um, and you know, I'm, I've, I'm a fan of many sports, but I'm, I'm also, I've been to New York on many, many occasions. I've been spent quite a lot of time in the US. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of the Yankees in baseball. And I've known that brand for, for as long as I can remember. But reputation is everything. And you look at that, this as an example on how that reputation can only be influenced by brand owners, not controlled by them. So it doesn't matter how much heritage you have in your brand and your name. It all depends then what can happen on the field. And so when you see how um, there, has been, there was a lot of scrutiny around the, the brand and the, the, the performance and the happiness of the, of the players and the athletes, it really does sort of impact on what people's perceptions are of the brand and the organization in itself. That links through to a brand like Juventus, um, a hugely well-known and well-respected club and organization that is has a huge global fan base and a few years ago went through in 2017 a massive rebrand. It was a, you know quite controversial at the time in terms of how it went and stripped away a lot of the heritage, but it made waves and it was a very modern and well-designed brand that had created a modern day icon really that, that made it expand away from just football but when you look at <coughs> what they did with that brand at that time um, and how that then can get affected by external factors so when you look at how that logo sits amongst all of those other clubs that are massively well known we all know that when you put those clubs together, they can have a hugely positive perception, but those particular clubs were also the clubs that formed part of the, <coughs> the breakaway Super League. And so therefore, the heritage and the perception of all of those clubs, but particularly a, a club like Juventus, was really put under a huge amount of scrutiny. Um, and because they, they started to do something that was 
very disruptive, very different. It challenged people's understanding and love of what they feel about football. Um, and, it, and it really made it a bigger question around money and the ethics behind it. But that's really then a question of what people do with a traditional brand and how that evolves and to do something much more disruptive. Um, and at this point, I wanted to sort of bring in one of the questions from Alvaro um, that, that was very much relevant to this. So, Joao, can we um, possibly throw that up at this point? Hi, I'm Alvaro Llorente of the 2004 edition. Here is my question. On the occasion of the ongoing rivalry between the PGA and Live Golf, do you think a legacy-based brand will prevail over a disruption-based brand? And it's a, it's a really great question. Um, and, and that's why I felt that it was this was the perfect point to bring that question in. Because when you look at how the legacy-based brand, in this case Juventus and all of the other football teams, were then trying to bring in something much more disruptive or compete with it, um, you can see how it needs to be communicated in the right ways and there needs to be a clear understanding of why that disruption could be good or maybe not so good. And therefore, when, I, when you look at the example of PJ and Liv, it's, it's a TBC at the moment. Who knows who's going to prevail over that? There is an element of positivity and heritage around the, the PGA brand and organization, but a lot of the players moved away from it to live because it, they felt like it wasn't giving them what they needed and, and modernizing it in the same way. You look at um, a brand like World Snooker, um, who are constantly getting criticized by the likes of Ronnie O'Sullivan, who's their, you know, they've been their main player for, for, for a generation now to say that the brand is not being modernized and the organization isn't modernized in the ways that other organizations are doing that. And so there's there's those challenges that come from it. You're seeing it in boxing with, with other boxing organizations and agencies coming to the fore with TV channels that are then facilitating how those those matches and fights are being being shown. But with the, with the chance, with the example of Liv and PGA, I really do think it's going to come down to how um, how authentic and credible each of those organizations communicate what they're doing. Can the PGA modernize and make itself more relevant? Because obviously that has been a challenge. But also can live on the other side, add that sense of credibility and authenticity into what they're doing? Because there is a huge amount of heritage and positive perception that comes with um, history and with with, a, with an organization like the PGA. So who's going to prevail? I don't know. But I do feel that, that it really will depend on what each of those organizations do to acknowledge the strengths of the other going forward. And that's where I think when you see it, you know, whether it's in snooker, whether it's in tennis, whether it's in darts or boxing, everyone has to evolve. Every major sport uh, is challenged by athletes, by teams, by by the by the, the the businesses that run those clubs, and that's a good thing. But it's also how those main organisations can adapt to change, embrace the change, but also acknowledge the strengths and the opinions of those other people, because their brands have become more powerful. Juventus as a brand, and the Manchester United and Liverpool and Arsenal, and all of those have become more powerful brand entities than those organizations that are behind them. And that's why I think, for me, it's a, it was a very great question to, to, to hear, and it, and it did sort of fit into that. But I do think it really comes down to how those organizations evolve and communicate that. And I'll touch on communication a little bit more shortly, um, because that is a hugely important part, communication, but also how organizations can respect and acknowledge the, the opinions and the strengths of others when it comes to why change needs to happen. Um, so then moving on, a brand is about experience. Um, and a lot of the things that we talked about before have, 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 have all play into that, that space. This is, this is an example of <coughs> one of the projects that we've done um, here at We Launch. We've worked with a, a two young founders of a, an ultra marathon brand called Ultra X. Um, they came to us many years, a few years ago now, and said that we want to be the Ironman 
of the ultra marathon space. So we helped to create an, a brand identity for them that really allowed them to expand their reach across many, many different events and, and continents. Um, and we've been <coughs> proud to watch this brand grow and evolve as the months have gone on. So that they've now really created amazing experiences and, uh, across many different regions and continents, but also allowing people to really engage um, in ways that, that I'm, I'm constantly in awe of. But this just shows how that experience really is just born out of a very small um, group of people that, have, that are tapping into a passion um, that people um, are, are really wanting to get behind and wanting to come together with. Um, a brand really needs to capture a local spirit. And a, the, one of the greatest examples and one of my favorite brands and rebrands, because this is always a question that comes up, what's your favorite rebrand in recent times in the sports space? Right now, I'd probably say Venezia FC um, because they really created a brand that went, and as it says here in GQ, it went from almost bankruptcy to the world's most fashionable soccer club. When you look at what they've done with their identity, with their imagery, with their social content, how they're getting the, the press and the reaction that they are, it really is testament to creating a brand that feels very much inspired by the local region and the area, but also is absolutely relevant and aspirational for today. Um, they worked with a very well-respected agency to create this brand. It was the same agency that did the Inter Milan rebrand, just for, the, for those sort of brand geeks amongst you. Um, and But what they did was create something that was, it felt as though it could have been around forever, but it was actually designed for the digital era um, looking at the mixture of typefaces, the colours, the shapes. And yes, as you say, Alvaro, they do have they have done an amazing job. And I and I've and I really do um I do really do sort of really hold those up in high esteem um in terms of um what they've done with, with that. Um I I think with, with regards to that question from BIP, um I think I'll come on to that. I'll come on to that shortly um, because there is a there is a section on that. Um, I, I, I do I do also know the people that created that um, that recent rebrand of, of Aston Villa, um, so I, I don't want to dig them out too much. Um, it was done, and I think with all of these things, it's done in, with the with the right intentions. But again, it comes down to communication, um, and and I think I can come back to that question from Bip when I touch on um, one of the slides later on, and you'll see exactly why. Um, another organization that captured that local spirit in my mind was, was the um, Iceland um, um, FC, you know, the, the, the governing body of Iceland football. When they created a new brand, they really wanted it to appeal to and rally the male and female team. Um, they, they brought together the four guardians of Icelandic mythology, the eagle, the bull, the dragon and giant. Um, to create this really beautifully modern and graphic symbol that that I just think has been really it's gr brilliantly designed, but it also works in its four component parts as well as together. Um, and so they, again, the, the typefaces, the imagery, it, like Venezia, like F1, they've all they all come together to evoke the identity, the local region, um, and it. When you look at that as a, across the board, it's a, a very well considered brand identity, you know, rebrand, um, and how it works across the different channels, how it works on merchandise. I think it's it's something that you know they did a couple of years ago, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm always looking back at it, thinking that, that it's a, a project that I would love to have done or said that I've done. But then you see clubs like Arsenal in the Premier League that are creating um, very localized content when they're bringing out particular new product launches and in this case you know their training kit the away kit so they're actually doing photo shoots around the local area that feels very much inspired by this example the Jamaican heritage and Jamaican roots it was all around Notting Hill and, and the you know that area but 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 feeling how that in that area of of um uh of, of London was was tapped into you know just the, the subculture the, the the feeling of carnival um, and the, the colours, the light that comes out of that, that imagery, even you know, the shot of Emil Smith Rowe with the, the colours of the buildings behind just, just linking into that, 
you're seeing a lot more clubs now that are tapping into that that local subcultures so that it appeals to certain audiences um and again you're you know so you're some great imagery here but then you also see when when raheem sterling brought out a new football boot you know for him but it was inspired by the the the, the patterns on the bus that he used to travel to, 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 to training with when he was a kid and and that's where it sort of taps into that new sort of idea of a local subculture that really creates that sort of feeling of we're part of your community and and, and so you know I, I think there's so many examples like this that, that that are doing that but i think that it was quite interesting how these are just from you know very recent times we see chelsea do it a lot as well with every time Chelsea announced the launch, uh, the the signing of a new player. They they tend to um, do that really really well in terms of art directing that photography, so that it feels very relevant to that player and to that that area. Um, something I really did like was was the the LA twenty eight branding for the Olympics, and how they created um, a very sort of modified, adaptable sort of system that was all inspired by local. Um, artists and creatives. Um, so they got um, a number of different local celebrities and artists and authors and writers to create their own A, what the A meant to them. Um, and so therefore they created a huge amount of content on there. And if you went to that LA28 website, you can see videos from all of these artists and all of these, these um, really well-known um, LA people that are telling their story of what, what, what the city defines to them. Um, and that's for me, is an example of how they can create a, a, a global identity for the Olympics, but making it feel like it's come from a very authentic place. Um, and I've talked about this before, and I think those that have been to, the, to my most recent um, uh, FIFA Master Talks in the last couple of years would have seen this. But Toronto Raptors for me is is a is a, a when they rebranded and they used that line of we the North you know we're the only team um, outside of, of of America in the the NBA really you know we the North is our battle cry and this is this is our shield it really did allow the whole of the city um, to 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 be, become one behind the thought of we are we are together we are doing something different. The logo itself, it's got, it's got attitude. The typeface for We the North is it feels like it all comes together and and evokes that attitude of the of the icon. Um, but then you see how that comes to life across the campaign. You know, they're they they're getting they're getting everybody from the prime minister downwards to to use that phrase of We the North to galvanise to 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 engage and encourage and inspire people to be part of that community. And, and that's where I think a brand jumps from being just a, a nice piece of design to part of culture. Um, very much like with the Iceland example, it's part of the everyday culture and fabric of, of a place, of a, of, a, of a person as they grow up and a, a, a memory. And that's why I think getting the brands in sport right really does allow that to really to, to, to sing and to allow an organization to jump a million miles forward. Um, and we're seeing it a lot more now with individuals and how individual athletes um, really are part of that, um, that, that, that movement to create their own brand because their legacies can potentially um, evolve and, and, and communicate in ways that, that big corporate organizations can't. Um, and you see the likes of Rafa Nadal and you see Roger Federer having a very philanthropic arm to, to, their, to, their, to their businesses. But you look at some of them create very iconic symbolic logos um, and of which you can obviously recognize quite a few. And then you get some more of the monogram um, examples. And usually when I'm presenting this in, in, in the actual um, in live, we, we sort of get people to sort of have a guess at who some of these are. But it's not going to be as easy today. But you can sort of work through everybody from um, Canelo Alvarez, um, to Serena Williams, to Stephen Curry, to LeBron James. Um, there's there's a huge amount of consideration that goes into, um, uh, and that's interesting actually, Adil, from the uh, your comment around the Sheila North. It's amazing how that really does sort of um, jump from 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 a, a, a thought, a campaign idea into everyday culture. Um, but I, I do really 
you know, look at how then those individuals are investing time and energy to get their own personal brands right and iconic enough to really jump out and communicate to their to their audiences. And if you look at their individual websites, they're all doing some very distinctive things. You know, Le LeBron James in particular has a number of, of examples of, of the different pillars and ventures that he has for, for his different sort of um, business um, models. Um, but the likes of Nadal, as I said, and Anthony Joshua and Beckham in particular, it shows how those global superstars understand what they can do with their, their name and their legacy and what they can do to inspire people in different walks of life. Um, and this is this is uh, something which just shows how organizations need to evolve. Um, and if you look at um, why, it's because they need to expand and to grow and to reach new audiences and always stay ahead. This is the MLS in 1996. <coughs> you can see how American the logos were, how, how the, the clubs were named in a very American way. Um, and then, you know, jump forward, you know, 10 years, not much changes, but then all of a sudden it does. And then you jump forward another 10 years and you see a very internationalized group of logos and names. So, you, you know, you look at some of those, well, you know, the Wizards don't exist anymore, but you've got brands like, you know, New York City Football Club, Orlando City, you know, they're all becoming a lot more international in their field because they're trying to appeal to that international audience. Um, and so that's where when you see it start to then evolve as, as the years go on, the only one that doesn't change until the most, until the very last slide was the New England Revolution in the middle. And that, that changed in, in 2022. So you can see now how all of those logos feel like they could be put into any of those international premier leagues um, and feel like they're part of that. Whereas back in you know, 20, 30 years ago, they absolutely weren't. And so that's why the internationalization of the MLS has been really interesting to watch because they haven't had 100 years or 50 years of history. They've been, and so they haven't been held back by that. But yeah, and, and yeah, you can say that they are trying to appeal to hipsters. In some cases, I wouldn't disagree. Um, but there are some examples of, of those teams that have done it well. Um, but, you know, there are some like Columbus crew that have changed their logo quite a lot of times in, 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 in those in those periods. Um, this now starts to come into this point of, about differentiation and, and how, you know, you, you need to create your, your point of difference and but also create something that is unique and ownable. There are obviously zeitgeists and trends in every generation. And so you can see how Juventus launch a, a very iconic identity in 2017 and FC Nantes in, two years later doesn't look a million miles away and then you, as I said about Nashville part of the MLS in the, in the same same year take a very similar approach to how that identity can look um, so there, there's that feeling of being ownable and unique but also yes you need to take that nod to the to, to what's inspiring you but when you look at this, and we talked about Aston Villa, and that's why I wanted to wait until here. So this is the old Aston Villa logo um, before they redesigned it. And that was why they had to redesign it, really, because you can see how many other um, very similar symbols there are in, in the football space. And so there is, a, there is a constant challenge now of how every team and club and brand and organisation can make their brand assets more ownable, more distinctive, and more unique and relevant. And so that's why they, you know, Aston Villa went to those lengths of, of redrawing it and recrafting it to make their, their lion feel a little bit more unique and different. Because as I said, a quick search on online can, came across all of these. Um, and, and that's where, you know, you need to always be conscious about how you can stand out and apart um, from, from the competition. Um, when you're talking about the MLS trying to appeal to hipsters, Bip, in, in your comment, this is what I felt was <laughs> probably the most relevant example to that was the Angel City rebrand uh, branding of the of the um, women's team in in America. There's been it's been a club founded by by some some very prominent um, female celebrities. They're doing some great things, um, and 
and they've really got a huge level of community and engagement behind them. The thing that, that um, and, and as you saw here, the reason why that was, was that between 2016 and 2018, the US women's soccer games generated more total revenue than the men, but yet they were still paid less. Angel City came along to, as, a, as, a, as a sort of like response to that. Um, the th this was the thing that made me smile though, was, was the, the messaging around um, how they communicated their logo. And this was the bit that, that I felt was very, it, it was going a bit too far to try and justify everything. You know, how the future is bright. You know, they chose that angle because the future is bright and how there's unapologetic optimism in, in, the, in the shield and it's LA all the way and it's honoring the past because of the base of the shield. You know, I sort of feel that sometimes brands go too far to try and post-rationalize why designs exist. I'm not knocking that this particular design, it's just the way it's communicated. And that's why I think the communication is always massively important in those things. Um, <clears throat> when you look at, say, Roma, who I'm a big fan of, um, I, you know, a, a, a good friend of mine does all the, the digital marketing strategy for Roma. They have got a huge amount of engagement, especially around their social media and what they're trying to do when they announce the launch of, of, of you know, new signings, new players. And they took out, took over the Fendi building in, in Rome and it was a hugely successful but but launch. It took them three days to pull it together. And we all know about the, the welcome to Wrexham and the good feeling that, that this TV show has had for the, not only the, the club, but the actual town itself. And you can see the difference it makes. You know, not the sponsors they had on their shirts in 2019 and 2020 to what it is now. Um, you know, it's, it was just incredible how they've, they've gone from nothing to now pretty much the, the 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 darling of every of every second you know fans team you know, if you don't support your own team you're going to support Wrexham um feeling like they've got owners that are trying to do the right thing and to really galvanize that local community and the passion behind that um but it's also important for a brand to partner wisely and how those sponsors and partners can provide vital funds it can also be opening them up to a longer term negativity if they don't share the same values and principles. So these are some classic shirts from back in the day. Um, we all know and love the Pirelli with Inter Milan and, and back in the 80s with Crown Paints in Liverpool, a very successful period for them. Um, <coughs> but then you look at, say, a club like Norwich City, who have partnered with a number of different sponsors over the years. And you would say that, that they've kind of jumped on every single bandwagon from traditional insurance brand, online gaming, um, and but now back into that traditional. The, the reason why they've gone back to Lotus is that they signed deals with, um, let's just say, somewhat questionable brands that um, even though after they announced deals with online betting companies um, or, or others, they've had to backtrack and change that because those organizations got called out and said like, why does Norwich City, who is a very family led brand and, and organization, um, why are they partnering with very questionable brands? And so Lotus being a very local um, uh, employer and brand within the, in the Norfolk area came back in and became that shirt sponsor for them. And you can see here, how every, every major organization are, are, are selling rights to certain things, um, whether it's stadiums, whether it's whether it's their, their what's your, you know, your preferred airline. Everyone's sort of getting called out on everything. Um, and that's why I think the due diligence around who people are getting into bed with is really, really key because you can't just, you know, as we come back to some of those earlier slides um, with, um, with, with various owners of, of clubs, you, you're going to get called out on them these days. Um, but those partnerships do, when it's done right, allow organisations to reach new audiences. And it really does allow them to unlock those audiences. When you see the likes of the Yankees and Supreme and Ralph Lauren, etc., allows them to tap into um, those audiences that they would never have had before. This is the bit that I wanted to talk about was communication um, and how, coming back to Norwich, when you rebrand a football club, it can be the most sensitive, passionate moment of, in, in the club's history. But what they did really well was create a little microsite that told their fans that change was coming. 
and they communicated why it was important that change was coming and why they needed to do it. So they talked about, um, and that yeah, was PSG and Jordan was very good. Um, the the um, when we look at the communication around this rebrand, I do think it's a, it's lessons that other organisations could take um, because they they managed to get people on board ahead of the launch of the new brand. So that by the time that it came to launch it, everyone knew that it was coming. They knew why it was coming, and they actually appreciated the changes that had been made. Um, and I do think that I'm right in saying that that one of the image makers behind this um, bit was also the guy that that, that um, was responsible for the Aston Villa in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that's that's where where um, I think communication is so important these days. Um, and a brand should never try too hard to be relevant. Um, these are some examples of, of, let's just say, less successful rebrands of recent times. When Leeds United announced the launch of their new crest, um, six months of research, 10,000 people consulted, ready for the next 100 years. Um, it was the Villa Agency, yes. And I, I, think, I, was, I think it was a different artist that did the, the Villa one. Um, but the agency was very different to the image maker. Um, and I think I, what was, his, what was the name of the, Villa, the Aston Villa artist? It will come back to me. I have actually worked with him in the past. The the, the Norwich City one was was the, um, the guy called Tobias Hall and Rob Clark, who are, one's a lettering artist and one's a, a beautiful craftsman. Um, so you should check those guys out when you can as well. But when Leeds United announced the launch of that brand, it was inspired by the beating chest of the, what the, one of the symbols that the fans do on the, on the terraces. Um, but it, it just got ridiculed. I mean, for me, it was very masculine, whereas it kind of it, it, it forgot about the fact that they've got a women's team as well. Um, there was nothing ownable about it. The style, it ripped out all of the heritage. Unlike Juventus, it was almost trying too hard to have a style, and that style felt very much like it was of a computer game rather than the, the sort of graphic iconic sort of status of a, of a, of a, of a, of the Juventus and Arsenal's and Tottenham rebrands. Um, and so that literally lasted very, a very short amount of time, but before it got pulled um, and that, that was very embarrassing and, and goes down in, in history as one of the, the, the most notorious rebrands of modern times. Everton, similar sort of way, they, they announced that launch of their, of their club crest. Um, and they actually got a public petition where they had 24,000 people sign up to, to, to scrapping it. And they got rid of it after one season. Um, <coughs> so much, so much negativity came out from that. And then, and then probably one of the most embarrassing was when Cardiff City, who are known as the Bluebirds, were rebranded with the Red Dragon because the new owner thought that it would appeal more and have more of an appeal in in wider Asian markets, international markets. But ultimately, you can't be called the Bluebirds and have a red dragon on, on as, as, your, as your identity. Um, and again, there was protests, there was a lot of revolt and, and marches against that. So it was, it was um, taken down and ripped apart again um, because ultimately Cardiff is blue. That's what they're known for. That's what they're proud about. And, it, and it, sometimes there are steps too far that you can, that you can take. Um, one of the most embarrassing was probably when you know Chargers um, moved and they were trying to sort of create this LA Chargers identity, um, and then there just became loads of memes and gifs around the what that where was that inspired by? You know, you see the Dodgers, the LA Dodgers, come out and said, um, you know, "Can I copy your homework?" And the Dodgers were like, "Sure, but don't make it too obvious." And, and how Tampa Bay Lightning have, have came out. It was just, it was just, a, and as they said here, a very lazy, very sort of um, of the moment attempt at a, a rebrand, and it, it, it sort of forgot about those, those all of those cues that are really important to, to organisations. Um, yeah, and as it was changed two days later. <laughs> so in essence, the four things that anyone needs to think about when they're undertaking a rebrand. The who, the why, the what, and the how. Who are you speaking to? Who's your specific audience group? Why are you producing what you do? What are the essential things you need to communicate? And what are the mediums that you need to be thinking about as you're doing it? 
good design does cost money, but bad design costs the business a whole lot more in the long term. Um, and that's the end of my slides. There are a couple of questions that Adil um, posted up, which, Ja, I think it'd be good to, um, I can answer those now. If he is still. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for doing this masterclass uh, with us. I got two questions. The first one is, how do you measure the success of a rebrand? Uh, I'd imagine stuff like hits and clicks on your website, post engagement, etc., is one. Uh, but what two or three metrics do you look for and what percentage do those metrics have to meet in order for you to quantify and deem a rebrand as successful? My second question is you went to creative art school. Uh, forgive me if I'm completely wrong on this, but I don't imagine creative art school being very intent on business strategy, finance, accounting courses. So how did you develop the business acumen to run an agency like we launched for as long as you've been running it? Uh, is it that as your business and yourself grew, your knowledge adapted and expanded along with it organically? Or did you do reschooling? I'd love to hear what you have to say. Cheers. Um, to Good, very good questions, Adil. Um, firstly, the metrics. It's really hard, right, with a branding agency because there's a lot of things that are out of our control. Um, for instance, once we create the brand, if we're able to have that relationship ongoing with a, an organization, we can help shape and control the quality and the consistency of how that brand is implemented. Because if, we, if we're tasked with creating the brand and the guidelines and the assets, but an organization wants to implement it with their internal teams, then that can really affect the success of how that brand is launched. You know, so we, we're working with an organization at the moment and we were recommending to them to do what Norwich had done with their microsite to communicate the changes coming, but they didn't want to pay for that. And, and so that's their choice. So the metrics that, that an organization, you know, when we've worked with you know, British bobsled skeleton, British fencing, what they're looking at are obviously the participation increase in numbers, the quality and caliber of their sponsors and partners, how they can open themselves up to, to a better caliber of, of partner, um, and also how, how much that opens them up to potential um, better um, television and, and, and media deals, um, because obviously they're going through that process prior to any rebrand and they're trying to get as good a deal as possible. What we saw with British Bobsland Skeleton, et cetera, was that they could more confidently go into those conversations and get the better deals um, signed up with the better sponsors, the better kit suppliers, um, because they had a stronger brand. And those organizations were much more readily um, to, to, to sign up to that because they, they wanted their brands to, to sit alongside the new brand. So I think it's a combination of an increased amount of participation and engagement, of course, of course. Um, how many bums on seats when it comes to stadiums, how much, but, but it's also then how much and, and what are the quality and the value of those partners, um, whether it's in media, whether it's in sponsors or, or beyond. So I think it's a number of different metrics, but it is all affected by how much we as an agency can be part of that journey on an ongoing basis. And the second question was, was what, how did I learn what I did? I think there's always, there was, I never retrained. I, mean, I, I, I studied graphic design. I graduated in that. I worked for many years in a number of leading agencies before I went out on my own. I think it was, it's all been self-taught. I didn't have any partners or, or backers. But obviously, there is an entre entrepreneurial in, in, inside of me. Um, and so I've got, you know, I, I, I had a lot of business mentors that I've, could ask questions of and and speak to, um, but I, it's just learning each time. You know, I started off the agency with me and one or two others, and then, and, and then it grows. And as it grows, there's more responsibilities and more things to learn and, and mistakes that happen because mistakes are the biggest the biggest way that you can improve and learn. And and if anyone hasn't seen um, you know Giannis's um, uh, video about how you know, sport isn't about mistakes, it's about stepping stones to success. That's the same thing with business. 
it's a really important lesson to learn and that's why it was so well received and, and, and it's gone down so brilliantly is that everything is a stepping stone to, to future success but that's why I think it's important to, to acknowledge strengths and weaknesses I'm not I, you know I didn't know much about business and, and and all of that when I started the agency but it's about learning and speaking to people every time we're fortunate enough to work with so many great founders and industry sort of doyens and I've learned things from every industry from charity from sport from retail from financial services and that's how you kind of like improve what you do um, so yeah hopefully that answered that question does anyone else have any other questions that they want to put in the comments or the chat right now If not, then obviously by all means, just drop me a, a note afterwards, um, and you know I'm always happy to uh, to answer any questions. What's the most common pushback you get from clients? Um, it really it really comes down to how much people are open and willing to change, um, because what we always try and do is ascertain how far on that sliding scale someone is willing to really jump. We call it the difference between a small step and a giant leap. And so sometimes a client might say, we want to take a giant leap. So we create some solutions that are all about the giant leaps. And then you can see that they're not quite willing to, to take that. And so we always really have to show them a small step as well, because they can either then say, yeah, that's not far enough or that one's too far. So most common pushback is, is more about how willing someone is to take a bigger step and a big step for one organization can be a small step for another but for more often than not it's about how brave someone wants to be and how much of a step they really want to take and how willing they are to accept that change is needed um, because sometimes especially when you've got a big board of directors that are, that are telling you no it's hard to really push through all of the things that are needed to happen All right, sure. It. I just uh, jumped in here for Julian. I can't connect right now, but uh, let me, in the name of the FIFA Master Alumni community, the committee, all the the members, people that were watching, and the people that will watch it later, thank you for this super interesting uh, presentation. It was great. It's taking notes. <laughs> I have I had to do some uh, my own work on on our own branding. Hopefully, hopefully the the FMA uh, brands also needs uh, some some real work. Is there another my my glasses? I, I have the wrong glasses, but I think Bip is saying something else. Well, no, I think it's just he it was up at four a.m. So thank you for that. I mean, and Bip, I think if you're in you're in California, aren't you? So I'm. I'm actually due to be in, in LA um, for family holiday in, in August. So uh, so I, I could be on your time zone then. So it's, um, thank you very much for the efforts of getting up at 4 a.m. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I, I know Alvaro, who sent a recorded message, was uh, connected as well. He's in Colombia, so quite early for, for them as well. And for, well, everybody else that uh, was here with us, I found it super productive. Would, would invite everybody that's a watched to to comment as well or send us a notes to let us know how did you like that session if we should do more of those you know and um, let's uh, keep the you know spreading the knowledge among our community sure yeah been a and, and I'm just, just one more thing. thank you if, if anyone's got any other um and, and I know that ideally you, you mentioned in your comments a couple of other thoughts if anyone's got any thoughts or observations of what their favorite brands are, their rebrands, their their um, you know their, their favorite partnerships or brand partnerships, please do send them across because I'm always keen to hear what everyone's thoughts are and what they're inspired by. Because the more that that I can get those thoughts, then I can filter them into future talks and future presentations. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. There's a comment from from Nick here as well. I don't know if you saw that one um, from Adil. Yeah, that's the one I was mentioning. But that's that's um, I'll, I'll certainly look into that um, because right. it's, there's a lot of stuff there that I need to sort of research. 
All right, Stuart, I'll ask you just to stay there another minute as I finish the, the broadcast. I want to say thank you again to everybody that's uh, watched. Whoever that's didn't nice. watch, I will send the, the link so they will be able to catch the replay. And I hope to see everybody soon again. Bye-bye, Stuart. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.